Well, I'm pleased to say that this morning we are joined by the Education Secretary, Nadine Zahawi. Thank you very much for uh, being on the programme with us. Lots to get through, uh, education, cost of living. Um, but I do just want to start with uh, Sue Gray and this meeting that was apparently held between Sue Gray and between the Prime Minister. Who called that meeting? So, two things to say on that. One, um, I don't know the details of all the meetings that happened number 10, but what I do know is that the Prime Minister has never intervened in the investigation that Sue Gray conducted. Um, he has always wanted her to go wherever the evidence takes her. Um, I've worked with Sue Gray. I've known Sue Gray. I know she has the highest level of professionalism and her integrity is unquestionable. She didn't pull her punches in her first report, you remember, and then the PM came to Parliament, made the changes, in fact, in Number 10, because her report was critical of the way Number 10 was operating, and the Prime Minister made wholesale changes in Number 10. And, of course, she will decide when to publish her report, and the Prime Minister will respond to that as well. The important thing to remember, in my view, is, you know, Sue Gray's been able to go wherever the evidence takes her and will decide how she publishes, what she publishes in her report. It's a really, really simple question. Mm. And obviously, you're not going to be across every single meeting mm. in Number 10. But this is a meeting that has been in the press since Sky News broke it on Friday mm. night. So mm. it would be, I think, fair of us to uh, assume that you will have asked a bit of this to Number 10 when you know that you're going to go and be their spokesperson this morning. The reason I'm asking who called the meeting mm. is because initially journalists were briefed that it was Sue Gray. Her spokesperson then had to come out and basically push back on that to say it wasn't true, that she didn't initiate this meeting. So who did call the meeting? All I can say to you is um, the meeting that took place between Sue Gray and the Prime Minister, um, I can't tell you... Um, who called the meeting so because why, why I don't... Can't I don't we, because did you not ask the question of number 10 before you came on this morning? Or did they just not tell you the answer? No, I, I tell you what the answer is. The answer is very simple. The answer is the Prime Minister will never intervene who in Sue the Gray's uh, investigation. The Prime Minister wants Sue Gray to, to basically go wherever the evidence takes her. Look, and who, I don't think, ultimately... Who called the, the meeting? Well... Do you I'm say just, you don't know, but sorry, don't, do, you, do, you, you, do you not know who called the meeting because you didn't ask the question or because Number 10 didn't tell you the answer? No, but if, if Sue Gray decides that, um, you know, when she publishes, she decides, you know, how she's going to deliver her final report. That's a completely That's up to Sue different Gray. question. But, no, but what I'm saying to you is, ultimately, there are two facts that your viewers need to know. One, the Prime Minister does not did not, would never intervene in this report. He wants Sue Gray to publish her report. Secondly, <clears throat> I've worked with Sue Gray. I know Sue Gray. Sue Gray's integrity is beyond question. So you're asking our viewers to accept that the Prime Minister did not intervene in this report, right? Absolutely not, right. OK. Absolutely right. And, and by the way, I, I just feel just, just, just that most of, our viewers, yeah. most of our viewers would have more confidence in that assertion if Number 10 could be straight with them about who called this meeting. And they are not being straight. Who called the meeting? Well, hold on a second. You know that Sue Gray's first report didn't pull its punches. But who called the right? meeting? You know that the Prime Minister would never intervene in such an uh, investigation, has not intervened, has allowed it to happen. Sue Gray's... You, you can't question Sue Gray's integrity because I've worked I'm with Sue Gray. I'm absolutely not questioning right? her integrity. And, I'm and asking her professionalism. a very, very you simple, will, you will, factual you question. You, as I will. I, I, one, I don't know. Two, I don't know what's in the report, right? None of us know what's in the report. Sue Gray will decide when to publish it and it will be published. That's the important thing. And then the Prime Minister will respond to it. You know, we're, we're, we're getting into... There, there are... You know, meetings happen every day. My diary is full of meetings. You, you can ask me a question, you know, who put this, di this meeting in your diary? I literally would have come on your show and said, I don't know, but it went in the diary because someone in my team would have thought this is the right thing to do, right? You're, you're sort of creating this I'm air of, of, of... I'm absolutely of, not, of, of can I just say? Doubt around this. I, I, I'm not creating any air of doubt. Not there. The, 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 the people who are creating the air of doubt is mm. number 10 because there is not a straight answer to a very, very straightforward question, who called the meeting? But That's I've, literal. And, so and I've, I don't want to have to keep so, asking the same so question. I've just said to and you, going round, list, but... literally tens of meetings go into uh, the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State's diary. You may, we can have the same conversation about a meeting that's in my diary. So how did that meeting get in so your diary? I, said, I don't know, because that's the honest answer. You're saying the honest answer is that number 10 literally has forgotten 
who arranged a meeting between Sue Gray, who was publishing an explosive mm. report, potentially, uh, into the Prime Minister and law-breaking Number 10. And you were really asking us to believe that Number 10, they just actually don't know how that meeting got in the diary. I'm, I, I'm saying to you that what's important, what is material to your viewers, is that Sue Gray has conducted her report independently. The Prime Minister has never, ever intervened in her report. That Sue Gray's integrity and professionalism is beyond doubt. You just said to me you agree with that. That is what your viewers should be concerned about. I said I wasn't you're, questioning you're, that. I said are. I was asking but you a question. But you are. You're saying. You're saying. Who called the meeting? No, no. You opened the, your question just now by saying, "Do you really expect my viewers to have confidence, right? If they can't, if, the, if number ten can't say who actually uh, put the meeting in the diary, I'm saying to you, you can't doubt Sue Gray's integrity or pressure. You say, of course, I'm not doubting it. But then you go back to the same question. Therefore, you are casting doubt over it. So let's let's at least have an honest conversation here about this. I'm saying to you, I don't know what's in the report. No one knows until Sue Gray decides to publish it. That's the right thing, because actually she's done this and done it properly. She hasn't pulled her punches on the first report, and she, I'm certain she won't be pulling her punches on the second. If I know Sue Gray, she will deliver that report independently. With respect, I'm asking a very, very straightforward question about who called a meeting between Sue Gray and the Prime Minister. That's literally all I'm asking. Yeah, and I've just said to you, right, I don't know who called the meeting. What I do know is the Prime Minister doesn't and never never would intervene in an independent inquiry. Okay. Sue Gray's professionalism is beyond doubt. Meetings go in my diary where if you if I come on here and you say to me, how did this meeting get in? I have to tell you the honest truth is I don't know. One of my officials would have probably put it in the diary. So let's not sort of create this sort of um, air of doubt around some a process that has been absolutely robust and rigorous. That's all I'm saying. What was discussed at the meeting? I don't know. I've just said to you, I don't know. But all I would say to you is Sue Gray knows that her report has to be independent, has to be professional, and I, that I have no doubt. Look at the first report. If you, right? She didn't pull up punches you, um, on the first report. You've said, you've said numerous times that the Prime Minister didn't intervene. Mm. How do you know that if you don't know what was discussed because, at the meeting? Because I, because I know the Prime Minister has been determined from day one, and he shared with, that with me, with... Um, other ministers and, of course, the country, um, that he would have Sue Gray conduct her report independently. He would never intervene or, or in any way try and um, influence that report. And that is what Sue Gray has done and will publish. And then the Prime Minister will respond to it afterwards. I don't know what's in the report, right? We will find out when it's published. What reason do you think the Prime Minister could have for calling a meeting or not, or having a meeting, I should say, we don't know who called it, for having a meeting with Sue Gray before the report was published? To, uh, back to what I'm saying to you. I, if a, a meeting's gone in the diary um, for Sue Gray and the Prime Minister to meet, I guarantee you it's not because the Prime Minister wants to influence the, the report. Um, if Sue Gray you know, meets the Prime Minister, as civil servants well, do... How, how that can does you give not, that guarantee that not, hold on, if you don't know what the meeting was about? Because, it, because I have no doubt in, of Sue Gray's professionalism and integrity. Because you have faith in Sue, Sue Gray? 100%. It? Absolutely. I've known Sue Gray. I've worked with Sue Gray. There is no way she would allow herself to be influenced by anybody. Do you have, do you have faith in the Prime Minister as well for I not do. influencing I, Absolutely. Very much. Look at the way he dealt with it in, in her first report. So you, I'm sure you'd agree with me. Sue Gray did not pull her punches in the first report. What the Prime Minister did do, he didn't make any excuses, he put his hand up and said, we've got a problem, we've got to sort out number 10, and he went forward and actually made the changes in number 10, brought Steve Barclay in to be chief of staff, brought David Canzini into the team, made other changes, uh, Andrew Griffiths came in to do policy, big changes in number 10 that are delivering real outcomes for your viewers, including on National Tutoring Programme, which is on the front page of one of the nationals, Today, 1.2 million blocks of tutoring for children to make their recovery. Six million by the end of this parliament. Of course, the cost of living that we are um, uh, dealing with, a global battle against inflation, 22 billion in the next 12 months, that's helping people. And the Chancellor is reviewing what more we can do as we see uh, more of the data coming in on the global battle against inflation, which the US is battling and the U Europeans are battling. A big agenda in this government. 38 bills in the Queen's speech. We're delivering against that. We've got a schools bill, which is going to mean every child will have a great education wherever they live with a great teacher in a classroom at the right time and the right place for them. That's what we're focusing on. Let's um, talk about the cost of living uh, yes. crisis then. The Sunday Times reporting today that Rishi Sunak is planning a windfall tax on energy companies, uh, which could mean that they get lower rates uh, if they increase investment. Is that something that you would support? 
So we will look at all the options. And uh, I, with the Chancellor and the Prime Minister and the Cabinet, will look at every option. Let's just think about your, the, the question of investment. So if you take what um, Shell are planning to do, £25 billion pounds of investment in renewables and green, um, BP, £20 billion. They both already pay double the corporation tax. The corporation tax is 40% compared to what other sectors of the economy pay. Um, there is, it, it's not a, a, a um, zero-cost option. Why do I say that? Because uh, if you apply a windfall tax, they will probably have to reduce or take away their dividend. Who receives the dividend? Pensioners, through their pension funds, right? Investment has to be real, which is what I think Rishi will demand of all these companies, and to see a roadmap towards that investment. Well, we're not taking any options off the table. The important thing to remember is the £22 billion in the next 12 months is making a difference. So in April, the £150 um, uh, uh, council tax <laughs> rebate went to people's accounts. In October, another £200 uh, to bring down their uh, electricity so, so and utility bills. So just to go back on the windfall tax, because mm. it's quite interesting. You know, in January, you spoke about the windfall tax saying uh, that it's never going to cut it. But it feels like perhaps uh, if there are discounts available to encourage investment, your position could change. Is, is that a fair sort of summary of where you're at? So uh, I think, as I said to you, we have to be very careful and very sort of clear-eyed on this, that there is no uh, you know, uh, zero-cost options, mm -hmm. because uh, if you uh, have a windfall tax um, in the way Labour were proposing it, and I think they were proposing another 28 billion of but borrowing... If there are, but if there are perhaps uh, things that would encourage investment, you would be prepared to look at it a bit more closely. So we want that? to see their investment, but also just remember, it's pensioners who basically get the dividend from these companies, and if they're going to cut their dividend because they've had a windfall tax, then that'll make a difference okay. to pensioners as well. So there are no, no um, you know, easy options here, but... The one thing we are determined to do is be on people's side talk on this. On this, um, I just want to read you part of the Sunday Times uh, story. Uh, mm. They say that Downing Street is concerned that fi simply funding pain relief handouts to households struggling to pay bills will quickly be forgotten by voters. Instead, they want billions of pounds diverted to long-term surgery that will boost the economy for years to come. It sounds a little bit... This is obviously from the Sunday Times, but it, it sounds a bit dismissive, doesn't it? Um, pain relief handouts, because these are people who perhaps wouldn't vote for the Conservatives anyway. Those pain relief handouts could make a real difference to people really struggling, couldn't they? Well, first of all, no-one I have heard speaks in this way um, to uh, that report in some time, so I don't recognise that. Secondly, uh, what Rishi has done is to effectively deliver £22 billion in 12 months of help. Um, if you look at what we're doing um, in July, uh, there is a tax cut because we're raising the national insurance threshold for 34 million people. 34 million people will get £330 more per annum because of that change. What we've done for those who are really struggling, those on um, universal credit, is the taper um, increase means they have an extra Although the, the rise in, as you know, the rise in universal credit is far, far below the rise of inflation at a 40-year high. It's very difficult for right, those families. But take the taper, that's 1000 and then on top of that, the rise in the national living wage is another thousand. That's two thousand pounds of help that's gone in. Local government councils know which families. I can tell you from my own local authority that are really struggling with the weekly shop, with the utility bills. We've increased the amount of help to a billion pounds, and that money's getting out the door now. But of course, Rishi will keep looking at this. We will see more data coming through. We are in a global battle against inflation. You know that because you see it in America. You're seeing it in Europe, right? And when he you know, finds the best way to target the help to those people who really need it, he will make an announcement, I'm certain of it. And you think it will be before the summer? Well, as I said, we keep an eye on this. and We're not complacent. That's why I worry about some of these reports, because... I don't recognise this language. It sounds like people sort of talking about this uh, okay. in some somehow, oh, well, uh, you know, we might need to do something. No, we, we are determined to be on people's side. OK. Um, if the government is to increase support, you need to find savings. Uh, some pretty hefty cuts to the civil service on the way. Uh, is it true that you've modelled cuts of up to 40% in your own department? So we're looking at everything. Um, in my... Um, uh, settlement... So in it, the is that review, true about modelling cuts so we, we, of up we, to 40%? Will, we, we will look at all options. The important thing to remember... So, yes, so that's... Well, now, hear me out, because it's important, because, you know, 
These are people's lives, right? I've got great civil servants who are doing great work in my department on my three priorities, on skills, T levels will be as famous as A levels, right? On schools, every child to be in a great school wherever they live in the country with a great teacher. And on families, we're building family hubs in half of England's local authorities. I need my people to basically be focusing on my priorities. So the way we shape the department, I've got 8,000 people. We're going to drop to about 7,150 because that's part of what we've done in the uh, spending review settlement. It's about an 11 to 12 percent decrease already. But we'll look at where else we can make savings across government because actually we are servicing a debt today. The debt servicing is 83 billion pounds a year. Last year, it used to be 20 billion. This is where you've got to ask Labour, who's going to come on next. Which I will. Where and, are they going to borrow from? They, can, they say they're going to borrow I'll, another 28 billion. Uh, right? I can, just I'll be to talking service to the debt. Labour uh, later. Just, just uh, is the 40 percent figure accurate? So we're, we're looking to model 10 percent. We're above that already. 20 percent, 30 percent, 40 percent. We will model okay. across that. The, the, the thing to be aware of is, you know, my focus is to deliver outcomes. What your viewers want is by the end of this parliament, I've delivered a great school in every constituency uh, for every child, the right time, the right place for them. I've delivered on the skills agenda, big skills agenda. We're going to stand behind every adult if they want to retrain or reskill at uh, any time in their life. £37,000 of uh, uh, investment. They can pull it off as a whole or in modules in the lifelong learning entitlement. But what I'm saying to you is I've got to shape my department, my people, right, to deliver those things. Um, I can't go to a place where I, I, I would actually impact delivery. That's my message to my team and, of course, okay. to the nation, ultimately. Now, you gave an uh, interview to The Times uh, last week that you said Britain should be very proud of its private schools and that Oxford uh, and Oxford and Cambridge admissions should be based on merit and evidence rather than tilting the system away from children who are performing. So do you think there's a risk that the system is being tilted away from private school pupils? So let me explain that. Yeah. What is merit? If there are two students, one has gone to my you know, brilliant state schools and they're getting better every day, and one has gone to an independent school and they get the same set of results at A-levels, then actually the university should take the boy from the state school. Why? Because he's had greater challenges to overcome to get the same results. What I don't think you do, you don't level up by dragging people down. Our independent sector, you look at what King Edward's School Foundation is doing in Birmingham, where they actually run independent schools and uh, state schools in one foundation. What Eton is planning to do with the Star Academies, um, where they're going to build three sixth form colleges in places like Oldham, in Westminster, in the areas that need that investment in education. I want to bring everybody together, right? You, you don't succeed by delivering a great outcome for every child by actually attacking a part of the system. I don't want to attack independent schools. They do a great job. They're joining us on this journey. More than school in Oxford is already looking at the, whether they can partner with their local I authority guess, um, and form a trust. That's a great thing. Let's you, celebrate that. You're talking about merit. And yes. I guess the problem that some people would argue is mm. that because so many private school pupils go to the top universities, that isn't on merit. And actually, the landmark report, the 2014 report, analysing 132,000 students over three years, saying that state schools with the same results much more likely uh, to gain a 2-1 or a first degree. So a boy who gets BBB at state school was just as likely to get a 2-1 or a first as a private school boy with ABB. So tilting the system, some would say, actually, that is fair. No, I tell you what's fair is I have to hold myself and my team and the front line to say, we can do as well, right? We can... I've already seen it. I've evidenced it in my white paper. There are great families of schools in high-performing multi-academy trusts mm. around the country. I went to Catmos Trust in Rutland the other day. Right. You, they you deliver still, great results. You still sent your children to private school, though? I, I, I hear. That was, a, that was a parental decision. I have to make that with my wife. I don't make that on um, my own. And I, I say to you, we have great independent schools. They're joining us on this journey to create real improvement for all of our children. But the way you do that is by improving the state system. Look at what um, uh, Catherine Bilba Singh is doing with Michaela. She's got a fantastic by the programme tonight on ITV. I know it's a different channel, but people should watch what Catherine's been one. able to do, <laughs> right? Look at Catmo's um, uh, multi-academy trust. Look at Dixon's Star Academy. Um, uh, the, the brilliant Phil Harris and what he's done with Harris Academies, right? And smaller schools, Hammersmith Academy, a single okay. academy trust with Gary Kiniston, 
delivering great outcomes. He's got 60% pupil premium, yet he stretches every child to the best of their ability and knows that there is no glass ceiling. You smash through it and you get to Oxbridge, you get to Russell Group, you get to other universities, or you do an apprenticeship. You do a T-level and a degree apprenticeship. We now are building okay. many, many runways for people's careers to take off on, not just the traditional runway. That's a good thing. And everyone's joining that journey, including independent schools. Let's celebrate that. I've just got one uh, question to squeeze in before I let you go, uh, go. I'm not sure if you're aware of the story of Raheem Bailey. Uh, this is an 11-year-old boy who lost his finger when he was fleeing from racist bullies, allegedly. Uh, he was beaten, kicked, pushed to the ground, allegedly. His finger was then amputated uh, after it was caught in a fence when he was trying to run away. I just want to get your reaction to that story and if we're doing enough to tackle racist bullying. It's sickening. Um, we always need to do more. Um, I suffered bullying when I first arrived on these shores. I couldn't speak English um, and it was hard. And you know, I, I remember my, my first experience at uh, my first school was Holland Park School being chased around the park uh, as a sort of uh, entertainment uh, for bigger boys and then throwing me in, in the pond or dunking me head down in the pond. Pretty horrific for a child who's just arrived on these shores. And you think that was a racist element to that? Well, I don't know. But it was a long time ago, but I've certainly been at the receiving end of other racist, uh, um, you know, slurs, words, whatever. You know, I was called a Paki at school. I had to explain that if they mean I'm from Pakistan, I'm not from Pakistan. I'm actually from a place called Iraq and I'm Kurdish of origin. It's called Kurdistan. Um, it's a horrible thing and I am determined to stamp it out, as I am determined to stamp out anti-Semitism in our schools or in our universities. There's no place uh, for racism anywhere in our society, let alone in education. Thank you for sharing your personal story. I'm no, sure that there'll be lots of little boys and girls who will find it quite you know, inspiring to, to hear of someone overcoming that, so thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Nadeem uh, Zahawi uh, there, the Education Secretary.